And up now is an expert right here at Georgia State, Robin Morris, who's currently conducting clinical trials. Thank you. Before I get started, I just, it was interesting sitting up here and looking out at all the tables. Um, I think there are parents that have worked in, and been a part of our studies at almost every table in this room. And one thing that Holly didn't mention was, you're not just advocates, you actually keep us researchers moving forward. And I really, really appreciate that advocacy too, because you keep telling us why this is important and, and why it's important for your children. And it's interesting thinking back over the short history of this field in a lot of ways. When I was in graduate school in the early 80s, you know, autism was because of those cold mothers. That's what I was taught. Um, you know, it was because of the, the mothers who, um, you know, were emotionally blunted and, and not engaged with their kids. And I was trained with that kind of framework. Um, that's just less than 30 years ago that people were thinking that that's what autism was about. So if you think about the changes in our frameworks and what we've thought about in the, in the world of autism, it's been amazing. The other thing that's amazing to me is to meet Martha <laughs> after all these years. <laughs> you know, um, the study she was talking about was maybe the first one in the country that actually did brain scans and brain imaging of certain type with kids with autism. And that was only in the early 90s. Um, so we're not talking about that long ago, not counting the genetic revolution that has happened um, in the meantime. So it's not just a journey for you parents. It's a journey for us researchers. Um, we're all on it, trying to figure out you know, all this new information and trying to integrate it in ways that when we were trained, we could have never guessed that we would be doing this kind of, of work and trying to figure this kind of stuff out. As you all know, most of the stuff that I do is focused on kids and their learning, and that's really what I've been focused on. And we do have some studies, and John and I have, have been involved in those for I don't know how many years, we won't even go there, um, on trying to figure out what are the factors involved in, that affects these kids' learning. And as, as, as Martha said, the day-to-day -day variation, the minute-to-minute -minute variation. You know, what are, what are the things that really impact kids? Because if you're fluctuating in your cognitive and learning abilities all the time, it's really hard to make it in school and in life a lot of times. And so I've been very fascinated about this whole idea of this in brain energetics and the, the mitochondrial basis of that and how it affects kids' learning. And so I really wanted to focus today, a lot of you know about the muscle fatigue that kids get, and I really want to focus on the cognitive fatigue that kids get who have mitochondrial disease and, and these things. You know, Martha and, and John both talked about the brain probably has the highest energy expenditures of any organ in the body, okay? It's this, one of the smaller ones, but it's a heavy user. And it's very vulnerable to mitochondrial disease and dysfunction. And children's developing brains use a lot more energy than yours and mine's do on a regular basis as it develops. And unfortunately, that means that they get more impacted by these kinds of problems than you and I might. Um, and it affects not just their functioning in a day to day, but how the brain develops, and that's an important thing that affects their learning and, and, and uh, functioning in the world around us. Um, the other thing that we know about the brain, which we've learned really just recently, is that there are certain centers of the brain that have more energy use than others. So, and they're sort of in the middle. Um, they have a lot to do with sort of the arousal system in the brain and, and the energy systems in the brain. But it's interesting that those same systems are heavily linked to social emotional perception and functioning, and also heavily linked to learning, which are interrelated. The one thing I think I've learned in this business is that, you know, the neuroscience when I was, you know, working in this area when I was younger was that the brain was going to answer all our questions. Well, it's not really going to answer all our questions. It's the interaction between the brain and the environment that's going to answer all our questions, basically, because. The brain is an adaptive system, and how it's functioning affects how it takes in information and, and interacts with the world around us. And clearly, children with autism have difficulties in that realm, okay? Um, and kids with mitochondrial disease sometimes have difficulty in that realm. And so these sort of energy centers of the brain are really sort of interesting to me because I really want to understand what's going on there and all these pathways that Martha and John and everybody are talking about, how does it result in these children having trouble 
learning about the world around them, and functioning appropriately in them. Um, I'm going to talk about cognitive fatigue. It's sort of the, my catchphrase of the day. Um, I really are interested in what causes it and the nature of it. And I really want to define that as it's a time-related deterioration in the ability to perform mental tasks. Fancy, fancy definition. Y'all all have it. You're sitting in bed at night trying to read that newspaper or that book or whatever, and you read the same passage four times and don't remember a thing you remember. Okay? Don't re you know, I know you can read, but your system's shut down. Okay? But in kids with mitochondrial disease, we think that they shut down maybe more often and quicker than the typical kid, and it may be much more variable. And the question is, how do we document that and define it so that when the physicians get treatments, we can document that they're actually improving this level of functioning for these kids that will help them be more stable and, 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 and consistent in their cognitive functioning and their learning ability. So let me show you a couple of things. We do know that as arousal, this energy in the brain goes up, you have peak levels where you really learn everything and everything's wonderful, but as it shuts down, your performance goes with it, sort of like the reading at night kind of problem. We also know that if it gets over aroused, you also have trouble. So there's this peak area. If you're an athlete, you know it's the zone. We have learning zones. We have functional zones. And our brain needs to be finely tuned to be there. And unfortunately, I think a lot of the kids we're talking about, they vary along this pattern all the time. And that's why sometimes they're there and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they can learn, they say things, do things, you're sitting here, and I've heard this from every mom and dad I've ever talked to about this, is like, it's like they're on today, or they're not. And we have to be able to document that and understand that so that when the treatments come along, we can say, oh, we're getting a more typical pattern here that helps us understand where this kid is now so we can do something about it during those periods. So I'm going to show you, Laura asked me, said, show them what you're doing. And so I'm going to show you a couple of the tasks we're using to get at this and some of the results from some of your kids, okay? I'm not going to tell you who. Um, just to give you an idea of how this works and how we're thinking about it so you get a better feel, uh, feel about cognitive fatigue. And I'm going to actually fatigue you in one of the tasks. It's participatory. Mm -hmm. Let me just say, this is a graph, and you don't have to look, worry about what it is, but let me just say one of the things we learned in an early study, and I have a student, I don't know if she's here. Stacy, are you here? Ah, she's still working, good. Um, <laughs> who did a thesis who basically showed that as a level of lactate and pyruvate in the blood, which is sort of an index of this toxin sort of fatigue in the body of kids with mitochondrial disease goes up, their performance on neuropsychological tests just falls off the cliff, okay, in general. So we know that there's a relationship here of severity and functional levels. But we wanted to look at more real-time kind of situations and get more real-time because we don't think it's a global thing. We think it's a uh, time-linked kind of process. And I don't know how to do this from here. Can you trigger this? Can I, it's going to be hard to see unless you can trigger this video. It's a video. Guys? Can you trigger the video for me? It's down in the left corner, I think. There we go. So all I want you to do is press the space bar as soon as you see the number change from zero. OK? Just watch. Just see how it goes. Quick. Got to respond. OK? You're just responding. So that's a simple task that a lot of kids can do. And I have to work with kids of all different ability levels. Very simple kind of task. Now, you say it's a simple task until you have to do it for 10 or 15 minutes. Then it gets very boring. And it's really, really hard to sustain your attention and your focus. And that's what I'm looking at is the amount of change that happens over time. So let me show you the result here. So here's a typical 10-year-old kid. We do this all the time. There are over 100 times they had to push that button. And the red line basically says, eh, they weren't with us. They sort of lost their focus. OK, we have all this data to show that anything over that, that long, it took them that long to do it. They lost their focus. Yeah, 10-year-old kids, they lose their focus. If you got a 10-year-old kid, you know that, OK? But not very often. You see a couple of times there. Now, let's look at a kid, somebody's kid in this room, I'll say, 
whose mom keeps telling me he can't keep his focus for more than 10 minutes. Okay? Sure, mom. Kids can keep their focus more than 10 minutes. Not this kid. So this kid at exactly seven and a half minutes loses their complete focus and ability to do this task. It's almost like they've fallen off. It's not a fiscal cliff anymore. It's a cognitive fatigue cliff. Okay? And we have lots of data showing that over and over again, these kids with mitochondrial disease have much more trouble maintaining their cognitive focus and their mental effort than kids who, who are the same age or even with other disorders. So it's not even that the kid may have another disease. It's focused just on the kids with mitochondrial disease. So we also have started doing some brain imaging tasks. And I, oh, this is just the sort of the pattern that you, we expect to see. Normal kids, yes, everybody fatigues when you're doing this task out over time. But the kids with mitochondrial disease are the lines who really, really do. And this is some preliminary data we have basically showing that. But let me show you the task in an MRI. So we're not looking at just brain structure. We're looking at function. We're showing them tasks. We're showing them information. I'm going to show you the information, and we're going to do the task. So you get a feel for how fatiguing it is. And then we're going to talk about how this works. Um, so I'm going to show you some letters, one at a time. And the third letter in, I want you to tell me what two letters back was. Okay? And every time I show you a new letter, tell me what the letter was two letters back. We'll see if you're awake. Okay? So here we go. So you don't have an answer the first two, but the third one you should have an answer. See if you're awake. Answer? B. Thank you. B. Oh. You guys are just saying stuff now. I you know. don't know. <laughs> I hear about half of them going, mur, 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 mur. Yeah. Okay. So let's say that I did that for you for about three or four minutes, OK? This is a high-level task. You don't realize how hard that is until you really do it for that long, unless you're really asleep right now, and then you know how hard it is. So every time that stimulus comes up, your brain responds. You can see the response here on the MRI, OK? It's a very systematic response. And it's arousing and activating because you're responding and you're thinking about this every time it happens. Well, over time, what we're seeing, and we don't have all the data yet, but these kids are showing a fading of that response very quickly. Okay? And what we think is, and you can start to see in some of these pictures, that the activation in certain areas of the brain, that these kids, and I'm hoping to get some more measures of this, are having such mitochondrial energy depletion that they can't maintain their cognitive focus. So how do you get by in school? How do you get by in life if this is what you're dealing with on a regular basis? Okay. Now, we have to develop some better measures of this so that when we do get other kinds of treatment options, we will be able to show that it has a positive impact on these systems that we're talking about. Um, I'd love to have a little needle, you know, in a kid's head to say, I'm ready to learn <laughs> versus not now, <laughs> okay? Because that's the reality that many of you parents who have kids with these disorders are dealing with, and you don't know. And we need to figure out ways to do that, but we also need good measures to document the treatment effectiveness that's coming, because the treatments are coming, okay, for these kind of issues along the way. So the more we learn about the impact of this disease on children's brain development and functioning, the better chance we have to improving their outcomes, their learning capabilities, and evaluate treatment. And if we can really do easily administered measures, you as parents may be able to monitor your own kid in a better way. Thanks. You know, thank you so much for being so informative.